ideal that in the costume and bearing of the stranger neither wit nor propriety existed. The figure was tall and gaunt and shrouded from head to foot in the habiliments of the grave. The mask which concealed the visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in detecting the cheat. And yet, all this might have been endured, if not proved, by the mad revelers around. But the mummer had gone so far as to assume the type of the Red Death. His vesture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow, with all the features of the face, was besprinkled with a scarlet horror. All right, let's pause, write it down at level one. Again, brilliant story. We set up the setting. We've got the thing about the rooms. We've got the thing about the clock. We've got the people all dancing and having a gay time, except for the moment when the clock goes off. And at midnight, because that's 12 strokes, Poe says that seems to have made it even more difficult because the fear starts to ratchet up. And then all of a sudden at this masquerade ball where everyone's dressed up, Somebody shows up looking horrific, looking like a corpse, with blood coming all over. And people at first are amused, and then they're like, you know what, that is not funny. We are, of course, in the middle of some serious plague, and here you do showing up looking like the plague. Not funny at all. Let's pause. What do you predict is going to happen next? And, of course, what is the symbolism in play here as well? All right, let's see if you're right or wrong as we finish our story. When the eyes of Prince Prospero fell upon this spectral image, which with a slow and solemn movement, as if more fully to sustain its role, stalked to and fro among the waltzers, he was seen to be convulsed, in the first moment with a strong shudder either of terror or distaste, but in the next his brow reddened with rage. Who dares, he demanded hoarsely of the courtiers who stood near him, who dares insult us with this blasphemous mockery? Seize him and unmask him, that we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise from the battlements. It was in the eastern or blue chamber in which stood the Prince Prospero as he uttered these words. They rang throughout the seven rooms loudly and clearly, for the Prince was a bold and robust man, and the music had become hushed at the waving of his hand. It was in the blue room where stood the Prince, with a group of pale courtiers by his side. At first, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing movement of this group in the direction of the intruder, who at the moment was also near at hand, and now, with deliberate and stately step, paid closer approach to the speaker. Uh-oh, here he comes. But from a certain nameless awe with which the mad assumptions of the mummer had inspired the whole party, there were found none who put forth hand to seize him, so that, unimpeded, he passed within a yard of the prince's person, and while the vast assembly, as if with one impulse, shrank from the centers of the rooms to the wall, he made his way uninterruptedly, but with the same solemn and measured step which had distinguished him from the first, through the blue chamber to the purple. He's right, walking to the rooms, right? Through the purple right? to the green. Through the green to the orange. Through this again to the white, and even thence to the violet. Ere a decided movement had been made to arrest him. It was then, however, that the Prince Prospero, <coughs> maddened with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers while none followed him on account of a deadly terror that had seized upon all. He bore aloft a drawn dagger and had approached in rapid impetuosity to within three or four feet of the retreating figure when the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, turned suddenly and confronted his pursuer. There was a sharp cry and the dagger dropped gleaming upon the sable carpet upon which instantly afterward fell prostrate in death the prince Prospero. Prospero, it's Jack. Then, summoning the wild courage of despair, Three. the throng of the revelers at once threw themselves into the black apartment, and seizing the mummer, whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock, gasped in unutterable horror at finding the grave cerements and corpse-like mask which they handled with so violent a rudeness, untenanted 
by any tangible form. And now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. Right? He had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the revelers in the blood-bedewed halls of their revel, and died each in the despairing posture of his fall. And the life of the ebony clock went out with that of the last of the gay. And the flames of the tripods expired. And darkness and decay and the red death held illimitable dominion over all. The genius of Poe, when we said this in our freshman year, and we'll say it again, the genius of Poe is his capacity to say things without actually saying. Of course, we began with this, uh, uh, an observation. We're going to study about symbolism here. Let's go ahead and finish, though, at level one, just to be clear. Red Death shows up. Prospero says, how dare you? Red Death begins to walk through the rooms from the blue, culminating to the velvet before the black room. And, of course, Prospero's had enough. The prince... How dare you? He draws his knife. He comes at death, at red death. He's ready to kill. And then a few steps before, he falls dead. Of course, in horror, all of the party goers, right, who have quarantined themselves so that red death could be on the outside of their walls, will run into the black room, and then all, of course, begin to die one by one, just, of course, as the clock begins to go off, right? as one by one each of the revelers in the blood bedewed halls of the revel died, each in their despairing posture of his fall. The symbolism, of course, taken together, represent what? Well, of course, let's write it down in 3B, the inevitability of death, no doubt, right? At midnight, in the black room, right? The prince and his guests, well, how would we say it? Run out of time. In spite of, yes, the prince's Best's efforts, he has been unable to keep the uninvited guest out of his castle. It's, a, it's coming. It's just a matter of time. You can throw all the parties you want to and pretend as if it's not coming. But oh, it's definitely coming. What are the messages at 2A that you want to write down here? The ones that for you resonate most powerfully? The idea that life is precious and you better take care of it? The idea that you should have compassion for all peoples who are engaged in pain and suffering? The wealthy, the elite, those who have the power sometimes think themselves devoid of the common challenges, the common illnesses, that is to say the Red Death, and yet, inevitably, it's all coming. It's all, everything we might say comes, what, full circle. And in the end, you cannot hide, you cannot run from death. We think, of course, at, three, at 2B, we already said symbolism, so let's jump to 3A. We think in 3A of the great Dickens text that we reference so regularly in 303, the Christmas Carol. Remember when the three ghosts show up to the billionaire Scrooge? He has achieved everything in life. And yet, when the ghost of Christmas past visits him, he's a little upset. When the ghost of Christmas present visits him, he's a little more upset. But what is it? Wait, wait, wait. Remember that? How is the ghost of the future represented in that story? All in black, looking like the Grim Reaper, takes him to a cemetery and points at Scrooge's tombstone. It's at that point that Scrooge is ready. We have often said at the conclusion of one's life, we all say the same words, oh my God. The only question is the inflection of the voice. That is to say, most people live and die, and at the moment of death, their words are, oh my God, what have I done with my life? Notice it's here that the Red Death finally catches up with Prince Prospero. Note the irony of naming him Prospero at 2B. Finally, three, uh, 3B observation. Why do you like, if you do like, horror? Why do you enjoy playing games that have these kinds of scary images? What is it that's so attractive of the Gothic at times? Why is it that you like to wear clothing, for example, that has freaky kinds of drawings? Why, for some of you, were you intrigued? I mean, just look at that picture on 380 of the clock, which starts to look increasingly, once you look at it, like a skull. Why are we so attracted at times to these visions of death and destruction? 
Some have argued because it reminds us that life is in fact precious and to that degree we should take life seriously. What was in your life to this point? What has been the moment in your life when you came to fully grasp and comprehend the value, the preciousness of life and it taught you something profound? It might have been in, for yourself, a loss of a kind. Well, there you go. The Mask of Red Death. One more reason for us to enjoy the stuff of Edgar Allan Poe. I hope you enjoyed the study. Thank you.